Many people enjoy visiting natural history museums, such as that in London or the Smithsonian in Washington. Although originally built for the glory of God, such institutions today see their mission to uphold and promote Darwinian evolution. Our guest today shows that the evidence for evolution is not actually inside the cases of the exhibits. It exists only in the use of language. Coming up next on today's edition of Origins, The Language of Evolution with Paul Taylor. Hello my friends and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts that validate the truth of creation and the accuracy of God's Word. Today's guest is Paul Taylor and he's been speaking on creation and apologetics for over 35 years. He taught science in the public school system in the United Kingdom for nearly 20 years. He's also worked with ministries such as Answers in Genesis and Creation Today. And he's authored nine books on the subject of creation. Paul, we're honored to have you here with us today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me back. Now, we're going to talk about the language of evolution today. What, what do you have in mind with that? It's to do with the fact that uh, one of my colleagues one time said to me, do you realize, Paul, that the evidence for evolution in any typical museum is not behind the glass of the case. It's in the words used on the front of the case. Amen. And so it's really, uh, it really got me to think that words are very important, you know, which uh, um, I think it's illustrated by this quote from Hamlet, isn't it? When Polonius asks Hamlet, what do you read, my Lord? And he just says, words, words, words. <laughs> Because it's all, it's all about language. It's all about how language is used. It sure is. So many Christians are frightened of evolution because they think that there's a lot of science that they need to learn in order to refute it. But there isn't. It's actually more about what they read rather than, what, what, than the science that they use. I think that's true. Let me tell you a little bit about, you know, what words are used for, because words are used for giving information, which is very important. For example, here's a, one use of information from words. Uh, this is actually um, my first uh, book, The Six Days of Genesis, uh, except it's not in an unusual form. It's a word cloud, and we're used to these. We see these on the Internet all the time, so the number of times a word is used is proportional to its size. So we can get some information about my book from here. You can see that the word Genesis occurs quite a lot. The word God occurs quite a lot. The word day, a fair amount. Uh, but you, Six days. Yeah. But it, this wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to read this. This doesn't give you everything that you need to know. It's not everything that you want to know on the subject. Well, the Bible has a lot to say on the use of words, you know, and, and the way that the Bible uses words is so important, so that we're very familiar with the beginning of the book of Genesis. And uh, that's why when we look at the beginning of John's gospel, it's so important to us, because the beginning of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God, is so reminiscent of Genesis. It's not, an, it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence. It's there because we're getting information from the use of the words, not just in the individual words themselves, but the use of the words. So words can be used uh, for good purposes, and the Bible always uses words for good purposes. So, for example, in Isaiah 45, verse 18, we have, Thus says the Lord, I am the Lord and there is no other. But that comment is qualified then by telling us who the Lord is, that he's the one who created the heavens, who's God who formed the earth and made it, established it, didn't create it in vain, formed it to be inhabited. Now, if language can be used in a good way like that, language and impressions and things that we see can be used in a negative manner. For example, most people will recognize immediately what that picture's about. They'll recognize it because a lot of people will see it and say, well, that's from Jurassic Park, isn't it? Which means that as soon as they've seen that, that means that they have obviously watched this evolutionary anti-Christian propaganda film. <laughs> 
I watched it too for research purposes. Research no, purposes. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't enjoy it a bit. <laughs> not not a bit. No. Okay. And, I, and I had to watch the second and the third, obviously, for the same reason. <laughs> That's a great story. We love it. But it is language. It's the use of language in its broader sense. For example, even in scientific programs, you see this bird eating this tiny horse. It's from a documentary series from about 15 years ago. But you know, the language is important. For example, look at all these pictures. These are all children's books about dinosaurs, for example. Every single one of these books written for children under the age of eight. Do you think that they're getting a message? Because they're all evolutionary books. They're getting a message through the use of language about um, evolution. So language is very important. And you know, when I'm going around and I'm trying to tell people about dinosaurs, people say, well, you shouldn't be talking about dinosaurs because after all, the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible, is it? <laughs> It's not in the Bible. There's a good reason why the word dinosaur is not in the Bible, of course. It hasn't very... been invented yet. Yeah, well, that's it. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, in the Hebrew and Greek, maybe it had been invented. This is the point. You know, most of our English translations still look back to the King James Version, early 17th century. The word dinosaur hadn't been invented in 1611 when the King James Version was translated. Uh, the word dinosaur was invented in 1841. That's 230 years later. However, I do think, and I'm going to show you this, I do think that uh, uh, there are words in the Old Testament that could be translated dinosaur. You know, there's one there called Talin, uh, which is translated uh, in the King James Version as dragon. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably the same, probably the same thing. But let's just concentrate on where the word dinosaur was invented, because the word dinosaur was invented by this man. This man is Sir Richard Owen, very important scientist in the 19th century. Uh, so important, in fact, he, he developed the whole concept of museums. Oh. This is the Natural History Museum, a particular type of museum, rather. And the Natural History Museum is a typical museum in London, but other museums around the world are based on this. The Smithsonian in DC is based on this, and other museums that I've seen. You know the sort of thing, even like in the film, Night at the Museum, you go in through a door, you have an enormous hallway with a big uh, dinosaur in it. You get the idea. Right. It's a cathedral to, uh, to uh, fossils. But what's interesting is that over the door here is carved the words, to the glory of God. To the glory of God. Because Richard Owen was a Christian a Billy who believed the Bible to be true. And uh, that's why he, uh, he had this place built. And over the staircase at the back of the, uh, the uh, entrance hall, uh, his statue was placed after his death so that he could look out over that museum because that's very important. His statue then was saying something about the, the foundation of that place, a place built to the glory of God by a man who believed the Bible to be true, who's there looking over his, um, the museum that he had built, but he's no longer there. His statue has been moved and has been put into a very dark corner of the museum and it's been replaced by this gentleman, Charles Darwin. Because the point about these museums now is that they're temples to Darwinism. Yes. So what I want to do, really, if it's OK, is to have a look at how they use words in places like this to try and convince us of evolution, to try and help us to worship this great god Darwin here. I'm sure there's been a few changes, but overall, it's the same museum. What changed when they changed the statue was they changed the statue because the worldview from which they were writing the explanation had changed. Absolutely. They changed the worldview, and therefore they changed the language. That's right. We have no problems with fossil dinosaurs. I love fossil dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. They're very, very interesting things to have around. A lady did come up to me at the end of one meeting and told me I shouldn't be talking about dinosaurs because dinosaurs were made by the devil. No, they weren't. <laughs> No, he doesn't do a lot of creating. He doesn't do any creating at all. Dinosaurs are beautiful animals made Certainly. by God. Absolutely. But on the uh, exhibitions, you, f you, s you see certain key words being used. And my friend Mike Riddle talks about this. He calls them fuzzy words. And I want to show you how you spot the fuzzy words. Here are two fuzzy words, probably and possibly. These are used to deliberately convey doubt on something so that, that you can't, in a sense, pin people down exactly. Let me, let me show you what, what I mean by this. On this next slide, I've got a, uh, some words from a display about hadrosaurs, and it says here, different types of hadrosaurs herded in the same area. Some had special bony crests, possibly to identify members of their own species. <laughs> now, do you see what's being done? What were the bony crests for? 
Okay, ask the children, what were the bony crests for? They'll say, well, they were there so that they could be identified. But it doesn't say that. No. They don't know that. All they have are the bones. They are making up a story and then getting out of it by using the word possibly. It's interesting they were a little bit honest on another exhibition when they said, with no living hadrosaurs to study, we can only, yes. what's that word? Guess at their herd behavior. And to be more accurate, they should have said, we can only make it up. <laughs> How about this particular display? Possibly, like today's rams and goats, Pachycephalosaurus engaged in headbutting contests to establish herd leadership. Okay, then. No Did Pachycephalosaurus knows. engage in headbutting contests? You've probably got that picture in your head now. These dinosaurs here butting each other's heads like goats. Did they do that? Well, how do we know? No I don't knows. have Doctor Who's TARDIS to go back and look. <laughs> They're just, it's just innuendo. There's just this suggestion being made, and it's not necessarily true. It happens with other words. What about these words? May have, might have, or would have. It's interesting that the phrase would have is often used to, as a fuzzy word to cast doubt, because it shouldn't really linguistically be used like that. How about this display, then? This display says about one particular type of dinosaur. It says the large thumb on its hand may have been used for hooking branches, digging, or even for fighting. Well, was this dinosaur, did it have hooks uh, to, used for digging or fighting? We don't know. We know it had a hook, a large thumb on its hand, but we don't know what, how it behaved. This one, the row of tall plates running along its back together with two pairs of sharp tail spikes would have discouraged the hungriest meat eater. Now, do you see the use of the phrase here? This isn't really linguistically connect, correct, but they're using this to plant this idea in your head that meat eaters are discouraged by these plates, but we don't know that for sure. No, we don't. It's, it's a story that's being created, and it's the language that's doing it. So I think people need to spot this, particularly parents with children. You know, we, you need to spot this. You need to be able to educate your children to spot these particular fuzzy words. Here's another example of the use of fuzzy language, though, and it's what I call the unanswered question. They deliberately ask a question and don't provide the answer. And I find this really quite insidious. This is fascinating because the question is an innuendo and it puts ideas into people's heads. Let's give an example. Here's one particular um, uh, display. Uh, what's it saying about these dinosaurs? Remains of these large hunters are hardly ever found together. Did they live alone like leopards, carefully avoiding competitors? Well, did they? We don't know. I have no idea how these creatures existed. I have no idea at all. But you see how information is being given by asking a question. And if you were to challenge them and say, well, you're telling people stuff that you don't really know. No, we're not. We're just asking the question. We're just asking the but question. But they understand what they're doing. And, you know, it's as if I started this, the show by saying, did you beat your wife this morning? You know, it's asking a question and it's, it's, it's insidious. There's a, there's a view behind it. It shouldn't be done because these things are not, uh, not uh, appropriate to do. The only science then here is to say that remains of the large hunters are hardly ever found together. That's true. That's science. That's true. This next bit is not science. And I need people to spot that the use of language is separating people from their science. This uh, particular display says about the Allosaurus, their size would make it difficult to chase victims for long periods. But, you know, there is no evidence to say that just because Allosaurus was a large creature that it was not able to chase victims for long periods. Uh, there's no correlation there. So they're trying to give you some information which is not necessarily true. We need to spot that. But then look at the use of the unanswered question again. Did they use ambush tactics like the polar bear? So what we're doing here is they're trying to say the behavior of the Allosaurus might have been like the behavior of the polar bear. It's giving them the opportunity now to say an awful lot more about a polar bear and therefore use that information to tell you about the Allosaurus. But they don't know how the Allosaurus actually behaved. What they have are bones, are fossils. They don't have that information about what it actually does. There's no actual 
uh, correlation between a, a bear and, a, and, the, and the other animal. It's just something that they're throwing out. Imagination plays a big part in this too. It's We're going to so talk about that when we come back. Don't you go away. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking with Paul Taylor, and we're talking about the language of evolution. Uh, which parts are actually fact, and which things are they just making up? Paul, you've done a great job of helping us look for certain words that kind of cue us on, on that, but also the imagination plays a big part, doesn't it? It does indeed, Don. And we were just <laughs> looking before the break at uh, how the unanswered question provides information that isn't really there. So that it gives them a sort of get-out clause. Well, the same thing happens with imagination. So as I used a, a, a question mark for that, we'll use an exclamation mark here for imagination. I find the use of imagination among evolutionary displays fascinating. And I need people to understand that this isn't just found in the museums. This is the same language that you'll find in your high school textbooks. Yes. It's the same language that you'll find on science documentary programs uh, and so on. So... Here's an example of some use of imaginations. Um, one paleontologist was quite honest in what he had to say. Uh, Eric Gillenhall said, what paleontologists know about the past is as much a product of their imaginations as it is dusty fossils extracted from rocks. <laughs> At least that's honest. It is, but it amazes me that you use the word know and imagination in the same sentence. Exactly. You don't know what you're making up. Exactly, whereas he's saying that it is. What yes. they know is their imagination. Right. Now, in London's Natural History Museum, I came across probably one of the best examples, or worst examples, if you like, of the use of language outside the dinosaur chamber. Let's go to where the big mammals are kept. Here's a life-size model of a blue whale. And I like this particular model of the blue whale because it is actually comparing it over here with an elephant. Okay, you've got the elephant there and you've got a rhinoceros there. So you're seeing the uh, blue whale compared with uh, models of mammals to get an idea of the size. That's good. That's a good use of museum space as far as I'm concerned. This is not. They're telling us that the whale, that blue whale, evolved from one of those. <laughs> a little dog-like creature called a mesonychid. Do so you want the evidence for that? Here's the evidence. There, doesn't this prove it to you? <laughs> no. Let me explain what you've got here. On the left, we have the fossil mesonychid with two nostrils on the end of its snout. In the middle, we have a fossil ambulocetus, which they claim is, a, is an intermediate transitional species between the mesonychid and the whale. Two nostrils close together on the middle of its snout. On the right, we have a fossil dolphin. Dolphins being the same family as whales. One single nostril or blowhole on the top of its head. So there we are. That's the proof. The mesonychid has gradually changed over time from here to here. Are you convinced of evolution now? No. Okay, so which of these fossils would you suppose is the oldest? The answer is, of course, the middle one. The middle one is the oldest. Oh, that's a problem, because surely the first one should be the oldest. Right. And what you'll notice then in the language underneath, when you could look at the time scale, and uh, this thing didn't really come out well in the photo, but you should notice that the time scale contains a sort of smudge there, <laughs> a sort of smudge, because what happens is they've decided that this is one of the first of its type, and this is one of the last of its type, so that they can overlap the time scales. And now, they're making that up too. They're making it up. What evidence do they have for it? The evidence that they have is that clearly this evolved into that. Which they just made up. This is a circular argument. argument yeah. This is a logical fallacy. They have to assume evolution in order to arrange these creatures in that order, in order to prove evolution. Now that is illogical. They should not be doing that. But you see that many people just looking at this quickly will say, there's the evidence. I've been to London's Natural History Museum. I've seen the evidence. I've seen similar things. I, I haven't got the photographs from the Smithsonian. My camera didn't work, but there was a similar display there on horse evolution that was doing the same thing, arranging them in an order. When, if you looked at it, the fossil of the modern horse, even though I don't accept the evolutionary timescale, the fossil of the modern horse was actually older 
than some of the three-toed creatures it was supposed to have evolved from. It does not make sense. So they arrange them in an order because they believe in evolution, and then they offer that as proof of evolution. Right. That's a poor use of language. Now, this happens all the time in all sorts of different places. And I mentioned how uh, we've looked at fuzzy words. My friend Mike Riddle doesn't just talk about fuzzy words. He talks about magic words. So the fuzzy words are the ones that give doubt. The magic words are things that are clearly impossible, but they stick a few million years on, onto it. Because if you give a few million years, what's impossible becomes possible. Billions and billions. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is what you can all do now. You can all do this with science articles, and you can all do it with high school textbooks, possibly so long as you use something that you can erase later. Let's have a look at a passage like this, and we're going to see how much science there is actually in it. First of all, what we do is we highlight all the fuzzy words, so you can spot those straight away. You see that we've got the phrase there, could have been, in yellow. I've highlighted fuzzy words in yellow. Another one that I didn't mention before is sometimes they say, the researchers said, or so-and-so said, to cast doubt on what was there before. It's just what someone says. So we've made the whole of this paragraph fuzzy. There's the fuzzy words. We've got some magic words there at the top. Something that's impossible to happen happens because of long periods of time. And also they're describing chimpanzees as cousins of ours. They have no right to do that. That's just their innuendo. So what we do next is we block out all the sentences that contain those fuzzy words and magic words. What we have left is the real science. And it's very simple to do. You do not need a degree in science to work this out. You can even do this mentally with television programs. Obviously, you can't put highlighters on the screen to do it, but you can do it with television programs in your head as you're listening to things. Listen for the fuzzy words. Listen for the magic words and discount them because what's left is the real science. That's very good. That's really true. Now, the Bible has a much better use. By the way, if you just want to see the whole article, there's the whole article once it's been done that I took that stuff from. You see that the only science is that one paragraph in the entire article. That's the, that's the same article I looked at, it, I magnified before. So the entire article there only has one little piece of science in it. That's all. That's, the, that's all there is. The Bible has much better use of language than that. For example... In Job chapter 40, this is what we read about this creature called Behemoth. And we have a good description of him. That he eats grass like an ox. He's got strength in his loins. He moves his tail like a cedar. We're beginning to build up a picture in our heads. If you come to this without a preconception, you can see this animal. Strong bones like pieces of brass. Bones like bars of iron. The chief of the ways of God. That means he must be the biggest animal that Job's ever seen. What is he? Well, some versions of the Bible footnote this and say that behemoth must be an elephant or a hippo. Now, remember that it tells us here that the behemoth there has a tail like a cedar, which is a very big tree. So let's just have a look. Uh, let's do the science here. There's an elephant's tail. Does that look like a cedar tree? No. no. There's a hippo's tail. Does that look like a cedar tree? No, no it doesn't. And I'm being very patronizing here, I know. But here's a creature whose tail does look like a cedar tree. It's a sauropod dinosaur. This is a diplodocus eating grass because they now know that these creatures ate grass. They found grass pollen with them. And so you, you believe Job saw a dinosaur? I believe that Behemoth was a sauropod dinosaur. And I believe that that's what he saw. And the, the use of language there is, just seems to be very clear to me. But I think, you know, just to, to wind up, we uh, go a couple of chapters before that in the book of Job, and we read this. Remember, Job's been questioning God. God then answers him, and instead of giving a direct answer to his question, he says, were you there? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth in verse 4 there? In other words, God's saying, were you there? And for young people who are getting confused as all these things are being bombarded with them, the best question to ask is, were you there? This is uh, tremendous stuff because it, what, what it does is it counteracts gullibility. Yes. We, are, uh, we, we, want, we want to believe what the people in authority believe, and they play on that. Yes. And what we need to do is sharpen our eyes to see those key words like probably and possibly and one can imagine, and so forth. And when we see those things, understand that that's not necessarily fact. 
that's just either opinion or it's something we're making up to buttress our theory. That's correct. And that's what you're trying to tell us that's today. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it easy for people to spot without needing a degree in science. I believe that this should be a part of what every parent teaches their child. There's a healthy skepticism in life because man is fallen. And with fallen creatures, we, we like to make things go our way, uh, even if it isn't the truth. And boy, if we prepare our, our children for that, not just in science, but in all of life. Uh, you know, you need this same skepticism when you're going to buy a used car. Yes. And so this is just a part of learning maturity and growing up, and it really needs to be applied when we go to the museum. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful job and for helping our, our viewers to perk up their ears and to sharpen their eyes to see the truth. And you know, my friend, I believe with all my heart, with everything that's in me, that if we see the truth, we'll understand that it's God's view that he made us. And that should be our worldview too. Sharpen your worldview, my friend. And I hope to see you again here soon on Origins. And until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1603, Cornerstone Network, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.